Hello everyone and welcome to the Skills for Mars podcast. Today I have the honor of hosting Dr. Agustin Chavez, Gus, shortly. He's an architect, passionate about the future of work, and even most importantly about the workspaces that we are going to have in the future. So guess what? This is what we're going to talk about today. Gus, I'm re really, it's a pleasure to have you in the podcast. Thanks for accepting this and doing this quite late in the evening for you in Australia. Oh, that's all right. Thank you very much for the invitation. Really looking forward to this chat. Me too as well. I'm quite uh, curious, as, I, as I've just told you. Before we get into anything, would you be okay to introduce yourself and your work? Because I think this is quite new. Yeah, well, thank you. Yes. Um, so I'll start by saying I'm, I'm Mexican. That will explain a lot of things, including my accent. And uh, I did architecture in Mexico and then came to Australia to pursue a master's and uh, eventually started working as an architect here. And I started working very traditionally uh, as uh, architects do, working in projects. Um, back in the day, I was working uh, designing a hospital. And, you know, hospitals take a lot of time to, to design and to deliver. So halfway through the project, and this is many, many years ago, the client wanted to change the X-ray machine from being um, analog, you know, the ones with old school that you have the films and you need a viewing box, to digital, where um, they just take a digital image of the X-ray and travels to the hospital. And that was amazing. I mean, it makes sense, move on with the times. And, but that created so many changes in terms of the design. Uh, I was particularly attached to a piece of furniture that I designed that was like a little desk where you, it would have a backlight and you'll put the film and you'll see the, uh, the X-ray and so on. So that created so many changes, but also physically that you could see and changes in the specifications of rooms and so on. But I was more interested in this, how information uh, flow within the hospital and how that will change the relationship between uh, doctors and doctors, doctors and patients and so on. And so I put forward um, a PhD proposal to see how we can better understand the changes of uh, technology and how they affect the, um, the way we design spaces. Because if it takes five years, let's say, to, to design and construct a hospital, uh, then pretty much the changes that happen in that time is going to be such that might be... Um, uh, you know, awesome. So long story short, I got accepted to do a PhD and that really changed my whole career. Mm -hmm. uh, and it allowed me to see design in a different way, uh, not so traditionally uh, the view held by these uh, traditional designers, but more encompassing, a little bit more broader and really embraced and realized that it's about uh, uh, including people in the process and the purpose of the organization. Um, I've read quite a bit, not everything, of what you wrote. And then you talk very much about making workspaces bring out our competitive advan uh, advantage, right? Our humanity, because that will gain the battle with the machines. How does that work? So how, how can workspaces really make us collaborate better, work with each other better, communicate better? Uh, it's a great question, but I think it, uh, there's some assumptions there in the sense that we need to collaborate more or what better means. Um, okay. So for example, one um, aspect that I'm particularly passionate about is this notion of collaboration, right? It seemed that um, if something is good, more is better. So we went through this uh, phase that because uh, technology allows us to communicate and collaborate like you right now in Singapore, I'm in Melbourne, and we can collaborate. It wouldn't be possible to do it mm -hmm. a few decades ago like this. And we think that um, we should embrace more technologies and so on to benefit from these type of interactions. And to some extent, that is correct, and we can benefit from it. The problem is when we think that because this is good, more of this is even better. So 
we need to find the sweet spot of um, human interactions. Mm -hmm. We tend to use this big umbrella of collaboration to summarize all the different ways in which we interact. But if we increase the granularity by which we refer to human interactions, we learn a lot. So for example, collaboration is one of them, but we also have cooperation. We also have coordination uh, and others like that, which follow different hierarchical structures and trust levels. And if we better understand how they um, work, we're better able to um, choose better channels. Mm -hmm. So for example, collaboration is very messy, it's very organic, doesn't um, uh, require hierarchy. In a way, actually requires that hierarchy is non-existent and also requires, requires high level of trust. So that requires some specific environments better done uh, where the channel can transmit a very big broadband. And that is better done face to face. Whereas, for example, uh, cooperation or collaboration, um, they can be, uh, the work can be packaged into different uh, uh, aspects. And then uh, it can travel very well through different channels, like digital ones. It can be email, it can be done via mm-hmm. uh, uh, video conference, and so on. The trust and the hierarchy levels uh, are different, and therefore the, uh, the, the channels are different. Go ahead. Of course, I have questions. So <laughs> sorry if I, felt if like I you wanted to much. say something. <laughs> you yeah, know, but please interrupt me whenever I, you you feel fit. Because I can go on and on, and I don't want that to be a monologue. Uh, I wanted to to ask, how do you figure out? Because each company is different, right? In some companies, you have there's more collaboration required than others. I mean, it, it definitely depends on the kind of work they do as well. Uh, because if I can imagine that if it's only a sales organization where people maybe go on Mondays or on Fridays to deliver their uh, receipts, right, and just make uh, they, their expenses, but the rest they are traveling for for client work, you have you have to design differently than for a company who's maybe working in R and D or uh, in uh, publicity, right? And they're all the time together having to do uh, to to bring creative work, uh, right? That's that's the scope of their work. Do you have any tools to analyze how work happens for each company so you can understand the level of collaboration and how to design spaces, collaboration, communication, trust that is needed so you can design the right spaces? Absolutely. So you touch on very important things. First, that is, you need to understand the organization because mm-hmm. each organization is very different. Yeah. And the problem is that uh, if we see that something works for Google and Google is successful, Therefore, we think that if we adopt or copy that design, we're going to be fully successful. Mm-hmm. But that is like going me going um, window shopping and seeing a, a beautiful suit uh, on a mannequin and thinking that it, just, it looks great on them. If I put it on, might not be the same case. Mm-hmm. So we really need to understand um, why do I need a suit for it? Am I more comfortable in a different clothes or et cetera? we really need to understand the specific needs of the organization because a solution that will empower organization to meet, to meet their organizational objectives might actually um, hinder or um, not allow the organization to thrive. So first thing first, we need to stop designing by trends uh, because that is a very big bias at the moment in the industry uh, because this is popular or not popular we tend to follow either open plan or stay away from enclosed office or activity-based working and we just blindly follow the trend rather than the circumstances or the reasons why we should adopt that trend going back a little bit to the collaboration issue uh, we also tend to think that collaboration should all be, nur- be nurtured to the extent that it promotes business performance. Mm-hmm. And some reports, uh, they actually have quantified the economic value of collaboration. Mm-hmm. You know that if uh, different departments collaborate more with each other, uh, that has an economic benefit or innovation uh, and so on. And to some extent, that is true. But also we need to realize that it's important, it's an important, um, human need for 
to be social interactive, even if that doesn't necessarily lead to uh, economic benefit. Mm -hmm. So we tend to think that the only reason how we can justify uh, a kitchen environment or somewhere that people will come together to talk is because it eventually will lead to economic benefit. Where we're not seeing is the benefit that it does to human sanity and to mental health. Uh, We can see this expressed in many different ways. One of them is the uptake of co-working. Mm-hmm. So yes, uh, te- uh, technologically speaking, you can work from home, and we are seeing now with coronavirus and these uh, new challenges how people are now being forced, even if they don't want to work from home. And technologically speaking, you can, but you need to go and have this social environment in which you interact with others, regardless whether that translates into economic mm-hmm. benefits or more innovation. I have. Uh, been fortunate enough to do quite some um, uh, research in co-working and do observations. And what I have found is that a lot of people collaborate as in interact with each other, but with not necessarily an an, an agenda. And this idea that, you know, this uh, co-working spaces, everybody's interacting and collaborating and this and that, towards some business goals is not necessarily true. People just like to hang out Mm -hmm. and to be amongst others. True, because honestly, I had this feeling. So I was looking at some pictures of uh, new offices, right? What new design is and everything. It feels remotely without being too deep in this uh, this, um, uh, area, right? That it's very much about aesthetics. And as you said, copying what big companies are doing. And on the other hand, it feels like someone is trying to keep people at work more and more by including not only their own activities, but a way to socialize, uh, a way to take care of yourself, right? You, now you have uh, mindfulness rooms and you have gyms and you have showers and everything, even for office spaces, which was not there. You had them in the factories, but they were not there before. Uh, so more and more things, shops. Uh, coffee places, restaurants, so you can eat and have a, have a good time. It somehow feels that it's a lot, or a little, a lot, a lot of the talk is aesthetics and keeping people people more at work. <laughs> yes. How how uh, yeah? How do you see this? Because you definitely should have more information than I do. Absolutely, and your first observation is quite true, and it's a worry to me. Uh, I find interesting how organizations are so different and they look so alike. Mm-hmm. So if we understand that each of these organizations go through different uh, stages, maturity, challenges, opportunities, uh, cultures, and we recognize them as being so unique from a collective of its people, its culture, then I can close, put a blindfold and then uh, take the blindfold in different locations and you will not be able to map which one is which, Mm -hmm. because they all look alike. They all follow the same trends. So that's a very big um, uh, problem as I see it, because we're failing to capture the uniqueness of the the organization Mm -hmm. and express it through uh, the space and the specific needs that they need. So again, going back to this uh, notion of trends or or benchmarking each organization uh, across each other, across sectors. Uh, it has its purpose and it serves some some um, objectives, but it's limiting the extent to which how we can really truly uh, design for that organization, especially now that I think work is posing um, bigger questions. Mm-hmm. And the future of work um, and the workplace of the future as I see it, it's going to be disruptive. And people talk about this, thinking about the technologies and so on. But I think we need a new way of designing. So the way that we are going to get or deliver the workers of the future is by redesigning design. So it's the, the space or the environment. And actually, I would like to expand the conversation from space to environment mm-hmm. because we need to also uh, recognize that 
it's not that employees navigate only through space and they, they see all the other layers that conform that environment in terms of the social or the technology environment as being provided by different parties. The way we procure the space or the, world, the workplace is fragmented. It suits the industries. It doesn't necessarily suit the employee. It has to be an integrated approach in which we don't say, oh, well, that's okay because that's another provider that's from IT, or that's okay because that's from HR, or that's okay because that's from FM. What we really need to do is to provide a holistic environment. Um, and for that, we need to redesign design. And we also need to um, redesign or reimagine the way we procure it. Mm -hmm. We have had very interesting conversations uh, with some uh, organizations that they don't see the need to have the conversations that we have um, with our HR. So hold on. I mean, we were expecting you to have this conversation just with facilities, you know, in terms of how many square meters, how many people can we put in per square meter, uh, the finishes, and so on. And where we actually need to elevate the conversation and include uh, people, we, we don't build buildings to see how many people we can fully, uh, uh, fit in. Sometimes some of the conversation seems to be about that. How, how many people? And th this was one of the questions. How many people can you fit, right? Because it's a matter of cost. Exactly right. So I did a presentation, a little TED talk mm -hmm. uh, uh, about um, um, cracking the capacity code. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the building construction code, at least in Australia, and I have looked into other construction codes. It um, kind of sets a rule of thumb that uh, 10 square meters per person. So that's how you need to allow, right? So that's for offices. But then you look at what they assume to that, that an office is. And the office, the definition of an office is uh, an environment for type, typewriting and photocopying. Mm -hmm. So we are inheriting an assumption that determines how many people you can put in in a space based on uh, an assumption of a workplace that in this case, the Australian BCA has not changed in 25 years. So there's people that are working right now that they were not born when this assumption of work on informing how many people can occupy that space are still governing there. But putting that aside, um, it should not be based on how many people you can fit in. And one of the analogy that I use is um, how many people can you fit in a mini, in, you know, in a mini cooper, yeah. in a car. So, um, well, there's people that do world records and they try to see how many people they can fit in. And of course, they just cram it in, but then the mini becomes inoperable. You cannot drive it. Uh, the analogy, I think, still holds. Uh, the capacity for a mini, I think, will be four or five people. You can put more people in until you paralyze the car. The same might happen with uh, buildings. Uh, you might just put more people until actually it doesn't serve its purpose. But you touch in another important point that a lot of people see the workplace as a cost. Yeah. The moment you see it as a cost, what you try to do is to minimize it. When you see it as a value, then you try to maximize it. And it's not just a play of words. It's a completely different game altogether. So one of the things that I've been working on is what I call business square. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, we're procuring uh, our solutions or commercializing our output in square meters in the area and the surface that you occupy. So as part of redesigning design, what if we think about instead of commercializing spaces by the square, square meter, by business square, by the ability of the environment to allow organizations to achieve their uh, objectives? Mm -hmm. How... I think it's hard to quantify that for organizations because the companies I've been working for, and I'm not saying there isn't a way, um, I've worked in business services, I've worked with data centers, I've worked with oil and gas. It's all about recharging the costs of the best cost center to a higher cost center, right? So the way they recharge this is not only the salary of the employee, but of course the space that they occupy. The more people they put in the space, of course, the 
least or the, the lower the, the rate per employee. So somehow they always get to that discussion. And when they build the buildings, it's the same discussion. So how many uh, do you think we will need? Okay, 3,000. How can we build this building the most efficiently so we don't pay too much per square meter in terms of just construction, right? Because the rest of the tools you anyway, you anyway have, have there. And uh, I'm sad to say, but I've seen some workplaces which are, I mean, they, they do anything but foster a, a certain type of culture or collaboration or trust. They do have a kitchen. They do have an area where people can sit relaxed, but because of the nature of leadership, they are, that space is never used, right? It's always Absolutely. empty chairs. They look beautiful, but it's never used. So how can we make this shift and how are you making this shift? And I, I'm sure it's not easy for the companies you are working with. Um, well, you touch on so many important things there. Um, first, I think, is to recognize that this is really, in a way, a revolution. It's not an evolution. So we're not going to get to where we need to get by getting better at doing what we do. Mm -hmm. So that will be the, the evolutionary path, right? So if all of a sudden people start sharpening their pencils and uh, making things cheaper, more efficient, it's a race to the bottom. Yeah. So what we need to do is to change, do a revolution and change what we're doing and how we measure standards and, and performance. So, for example, um, one of the biggest uh, shortcomings I see is this legacy of the notion of productivity, which is a legacy of the conveyor belt of how we measure the performance of machines, mm -hmm. input versus output. And then that is extended to humans, right? But the moment we recognize that is wrong for many reasons, and I'm going to touch on, on some of them, uh, then we see we need another model. Mm -hmm. And then that's why we cannot talk. This, this change will not come just from the architect saying, oh, you, you should value your people, or from HR, or from IT. It should come from uh, re redesigning the organization first. So that uh, level of maturity or view of organization, it's come from the organization themselves. And then they're going to face so many problems without getting too technical. It's even how they allocate the budget. So, for example, architecture traditionally fits within CapEx, mm -hmm. capital expenditure. So here's your budget. Yeah. Here's one off because we, at the end of it, we just want the building and we will move on. Hold on, where's the OPEX? There's no OPEX allowed or operational uh, mm -hmm. expenditure for us to maintain that uh, environment. And the assumption is that we, it's a set and forget uh, solution. There's your building, it works beautifully, pay me and that's yeah. it. So one of the things we're trying to also do as part of this approach is to use the notion of living labs. Mm -hmm. One in which we see the building once it's occupied as prototype 1.0, the best assumption that we can come up with based on what we know of how the organization is going to work. But then it requires fine tuning, requires to be uh, every six months or so, just like you take your car for fine tuning and so, for us to uh, better uh, fine tune the design. The problem is this type of approach is seen as a fault uh, design or as an incompetent architect that could not come up with the right solution. <laughs> Whereas what we're saying is, <laughs> no, the, the, that the flaw is applicable to the design process. Mm -hmm. So it's not about good designs and bad designs. Actually, the good designer will know that even if we provide the best environment at day one, you as an organization is going to change. So we need to constantly change the environment. So is there then, is that the, that the best model of the, of the organization, of the actual space? Is it a flexible space with flexible walls, flexible desks that you can easily move around based on the needs? Because I'm not only this, uh, talking about changing the organization design, right, and moving teams around, but even changing company culture, right? Every uh, five or 10 or so years, especially now due to the digital age and this transformation every company is going through, Pretty much everyone I've heard is trying to change their work culture. So if this is happening, let's say you're building the building today, 
the culture is this, but then the company is moving towards and is transforming itself. So maybe in two years from now, they will be in a different place and they want the space to reflect that. So in this case, is there better design, like a really flexible kind of... The flexibility and, is... No. Uh, I think flexibility also can lead us to very dark places and wrong solutions. Mm-hmm. It's like giving uh, a newborn a 10-year-old suit because you're going to grow into it, you know? <laughs> so we need to be, give the child as it grows different, <laughs> different uh, sizes and different clothes. Um, so the idea of flexibility is very dangerous because then you can just do whatever. Vanilla, this, let's just design to please everyone, everyone and, uh, and anything. And the problem with that is that you're not targeting any function properly. So I'm not I'm here. I'm not proposing flexibility, uh, not commit to anything, and then we just change uh, so that it can uh, fit for everything. Quite the opposite. Targeted solutions for the stage at which the organization is at. Mm-hmm. So for f- too long, we have been uh, favoring or the view that organizational growth is a quantitative problem. Another of our research projects I've been involved in is, is to understand how organizations grow. Mm-hmm. From the point of view of the architect, uh, for too long, it has been a quantitative problem. People just grow, organizations just grow in headcount. We just yep. need more area. And that's the only uh, problem we need to deal with. But through this research, it's becoming increasingly apparent that as organizations grow, they also change qualitative, not only quantitative. Mm-hmm. So the argument here is that the space not only needs to be bigger, but needs to be different. So we need to very carefully manage that. And again, I, I'm a little bit opposed of the notion of flexibility mm-hmm. in, in design, perhaps elasticity. So in the way that perhaps, okay, your, your jacket, we just buy it a little bit bigger just for you to grow into it, uh, but, but not flexible <laughs> enough so that you're going to use it for the rest of your life. Mm-hmm. Uh, so very targeted um, solutions uh, for meet the specific challenges. Have you have do you have an example where you have created that with Hassel maybe and uh, you've seen changes in culture and you've seen changes in work behavior? We we have this um, model that is called raw responsive agile workplace, and what it aims to do is pretty much uh, put all, all these um, into practice. Mm-hmm. So. It's called responsive agile workplace. They, they, I think to follow your idea of flexibility is tackled through responsiveness. Mm-hmm. So the idea that the workplace changes based on the feedback that we're getting from the environment. An environment that is flexible is not getting that feedback. It's just allowing for change through its lack of commitment to the solution. The, propo- the, the, the design that we're proposing here is a design that is committed, but it changes based on what we're getting from the uh, environment. Mm -hmm. And this is where we're starting to work with um, uh, universities like INSEA through FANISH and so on, and our organizations with the University of Melbourne, trying to understand what do we measure and then how do we react to it. So, for example, it's been increasingly... uh, being put forward that dignity might be a better measurement of organizational performance than traditional measurements of productivity. So we just finished one of the first uh, research that uh, we are aware of in which we are trying to correlate um, survey that we adapted from uh, one of the researchers in the U.S. that we're working closely with, developed this uh, workplace dignity scale. Okay. And we are using some of those questions and we overlap that with social network mapping. So now we're trying to see how um, and if dignity travels through social networks. And if so, how can we support uh, um, those networks using Mm -hmm. space? This seems great. So we are talking about dignity in the workplace, right? Is this related to 
because I've never heard of such report um, research, so I've, it's quite fascinating. Is this related to workers' efficiency, to how efficiently we work, or how we how 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 performant we are? It's, it's relating as uh, so dignity is um, measurement of self worth of one self worth, right? So, but it has two components: my individual mm -hmm. sense of worth. And then the, the, uh, the, the, the validation yeah. of that. So I might have as whatever uh, measurement of self, sense of worth, but that is moderated by the social system. Mm -hmm. That's why uh, it's very important to put this in the context of social networks. And what we're looking at is equality. Um, what we're looking at is uh, um, Valuing as a person, not objectification. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to objectify people in the workplace. So all of a sudden, if uh, I objectify you, if you are um, good at doing Excel, for example, mm -hmm. I stop looking at you as a person. I just look at you as a resource that is good to uh, do Excel spreadsheets and so on. Um, so then when you have a problem that is a human problem, a personal problem doesn't follow that model. But if we adopt the dignity scale, and this has many different parameters, we just limited for this pilot research to five that measures the quality and, and, and so on. And what we're finding is there are some interesting correlations there. We um, study gender, right? Mm -hmm. So differences in gender, if there's a difference between males and females. So what we found in a specific organization that we've been working for quite a long time is that there's differences in the um, in gender differences, right? So women are underrepresented below the demographic um, in, in the organization in exchanging of ideas, in review and approve, and in um, Exchanging of ideas, review and approve. And there's another one that escaped in my mm -hmm. mind, but I'll tell you in a second. But in terms of information exchange, they're spot on in their demographic. What that means is that women are actually make, doing their job when it comes about sending those information. Mm -hmm. But when it comes in terms of generate ideas, they're underrepresented. Why is this a problem? Because if you hire more women in the organization, other research by others suggests that they might leave if they're not feeling in part of the organization or they're not shaping that organization. Mm -hmm. There's a lot that has been said about uh, the use of design for attracting or retaining talent. We even call it um, uh, bribery by design sometimes, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, to, to what extent do we actually bribing people, as you were saying, like the Googles and this and that, just putting things there, uh, so please don't go. But eventually, people will say, you know what, God, I really love the uh, the red carpet and the green painting or whatever, but this is not working for me. It doesn't matter how many times you change the, uh, the, the carpet if the uh, organization is not um, inclusive of that demographic. But, and this is what gets so interesting, so when we slice the um, the dignity data by a uh, number of interactions and by gender, what we found is that there were some tiny differences in um, by gender. So in consistency with all the data that we um, have collected in this organization, women were worse off than men. But in this case, in dignity, was, the difference was not as big as the best indicator of high dignity was not whether you were a female or male, but the number of connections that you had in the organization. The organization. So, uh, in the, represented in the network. So, long story short, people that were, had more connections have a higher, tend to have a higher uh, dignity score uh, than the people that have lower. And these connections, importantly, were uh, more important when they were face-to-face. -face. Mm -hmm. When you slice data 
by telephone is not the same. It doesn't build the same type of rapport. It does not contribute to the mm-hmm. ET as much. So this brings back, uh, back space to the equation. So we have been trying to kill the office uh, for so many years, you know, since Chiat's uh, virtual office. And because we think that information can travel virtually, mm-hmm. therefore the workplace can as well. You know, like the, the office is just an obsolete uh, uh, shell that can be discarded now that information travels digitally. But in, by, I love that, that assumption because it allows them to test why is it still needed. Um, you know, uh, Marisa Meyer, when she became a CEO of um, Yahoo, the first thing she did, one of the first things she did was cancel the work from home policy. Mm-hmm. And I remember uh, one of the uh, headlines of the, um, what was the New York Times, I think it was, Marisa Meyer bringing uh, Yahoo back to the Stone Age by, by, by um, getting employees back in the office. Because we thought that there was a narrow of time, mm-hmm. thinking that the future was dis- dispersed. And by bringing them back to the office, mm-hmm. it was um, back to the past. Uh, then 2017, just getting my dates right. So 2017, 2018, IBM did the same. And IBM, IBM invested uh, a lot of uh, money into developing these virtual uh, interactions. And they are bringing people back to the, uh, to the office, to the brick and mortar office, to bring that sense of collegiality, to bring together um, people. And Apple, they just built a $5 billion corporate campus if anyone can bring remote, work remotely, would be IBM, Yahoo, and Apple. And Apple. Why are they bre- building these uh, temples uh, of work um, using bricks and mortals, mm-hmm. uh, mortar? Well, it's because we're starting to recognize the attributes of space, the persistence of space, and how it brings people together, and how it allows to interact and communicate messages are very difficult to codify in other channels. So we think that the future of work or the future of the workplace um, is evolving from being functional to being social. Mm -hmm. So we used to design for functionality purposes mainly for the ability to do, for you to do the activities that you needed to do. So if you needed to do an email or a PowerPoint presentation, we designed it for that. But now it's obvious that you can do PowerPoint presentations or Excels or send emails wherever you want. But what you cannot get is sense of purpose, sense of belonging and leadership that easily in remote environments. So what we, another research that we're working on is we call it making space for leadership. Mm-hmm. What are the attributes of space that allow us to transfer these very complex um, cues of leadership, of purpose, of meaning, of uh, of belonging, and how we can better design for that. So I was actually going to ask you that because, as you just said before, sometimes it can feel like you might be attracting employees with a nice uh, red carpet and green paint, right? And it's a freshly built uh, company and they might be really mesmerized by what you've built. But that's because you've maybe copied Google or Apple or, or whatever. Uh, but when they actually get hired, right, they are facing, uh, I don't know, cruel leadership, uh, mostly dictatorship. And it's, there's no relation between the actual space, which looks beautiful and seems collaborative and seems like it's allowed for creativity. But actually, they get into, into this yeah, leadership and, and cultural trap. How are, how are things designed so you can foster good behaviors, the good leadership behaviors? So where is your uh, research question. leading you? I know, it's, I know it's early stages, but where is it leading you? Well, um, it's a great question. And this, we wrote a, a paper, Fanish and myself, mm-hmm. on this. And, um, and we asked the question a little bit different, but it goes to the same um, area that you're discussing. 
and we call gimmicks and game changers. So for example, is, um, you know, the, uh, the red beanbag, you know, it's the ultimate mm -hmm. essential example of, of the trendy, can be a gimmick or can be a game changer depending on three things. So what we uh, identify in this little short uh, paper is that we need to integrate organizational design experience design and workplace design. Mm -hmm. Once you have, it's like three legs of the same stool. If one is missing, you're gonna tumble. So the same solution, the poor red beanbag that's been flag around as the problem of future workplace, but can, can be one or the other. So there's not one solution that um, works or not. Another example is uh, dogs in the workplace. Um, when we were doing this research on organizational growth, uh, it was fascinating because there, this particular organization, they did projections uh, of growth and they thought they might reach their limit of how many dogs they could have in the workplace rather than humans. So they might have to leave <laughs> or find another, another place. Uh, to work from because they might reach the maximum numbers of dogs they could uh, bring. Now, is bringing the, the dog to your to the office a gimmick or a game changer? For some organizations, what would be one and for others would be the other one. Mm -hmm. um, in this particular uh, organization that we were searching on, they were attracting a demographic which they call um, they don't have babies, they have furry babies. You know, they're, they're uh, young professionals, uh, single or couples, but they don't have human babies. They have fur babies, they have dogs and they treat them as if they were uh, their human babies. So for them, it creates a lot of stress and anxiety uh, to leave their home, uh, their dog at home. So bringing that dog to home uh, gives them tranquility. They can work for longer. So again, uh, mm -hmm. organizations don't do things in altruistic mm -hmm. manners. It always have to have a business driver. Uh, instead of leaving at five to go and walk the dog, they bring the dog and then they leave at 9 p.m. You know, because they're playing with the dog all day and so on. So we need to understand that for something to uh, be the difference between a gimmick and a game changer it has to be the alignment of this mm -hmm. organizational design, experience design, how it's delivered, and um, workplace design. And also recognize that some short-term gains uh, will backfire. Eventually, if you have a cafeteria and you have muffins and free this and free that, some people might stay. But that those might just stay because of that. And it will be a problem if you only have people staying because of the bells and, uh, bells and whistles and not because of the alignment with the organization. Yeah, but I, what, so from what I witnessed, people at some point give up facilities to have better leadership, better cultures, uh, friends at work. So that's something definitely that's going towards that trend. Gus, while I, so, I, while I heard you talking, I could not help myself, but wonder, I see the point of all of this. The companies I'm, I'm working for are quite old. Um, I would have a hard time pitching this to them because all they see is the next quarter or the next half year or the end of the year. A lot of them are going digital. A lot of them are restructuring. How their employees interact, how this forms culture is not necessarily in the back of their minds, even if they would like to change it, even if they would like to, to, to even disrupt what they're doing right now. So how, I guess you're having a hard time pitching this to companies. <laughs> how are you doing Absolutely. it? The... Not, not, only, not only with companies, but within the profession, mm -hmm. because uh, again, this is challenging even the assumptions of clients. Uh, uh, so organizations, well, hold on. What do you mean you need to talk to HR about uh, gender inequality? Or what do you mean you, you need to talk about this? or this? So we are raising issues that they were not traditionally mm -hmm. that comes from the architect's quarters. So if you think about the organization traditionally being described as the intersection of people, space, and technology, right? And the organization lives in the middle. So 
Traditionally, architects have been operating at the center of space, procuring space. The good ones are moving to the intersection of uh, their neighbors, mm -hmm. uh, HR and IT. But still, there's a big vacuum that exists in the, in the center of the intersection. So what we're proposing is to meet not at the boundaries of our profession, but in the intersection of the three. And for that, it's not only a change that will come on from the architect. We need to meet uh, with HR, with an, IT, with an IT and so on, and be there. How do you do this? Um, there will be organizations that they don't see, they don't share this view, and that's okay. This, this, this will not uh, uh, interest all of them. In my view, those organizations will not carry on into the workplace of the future. Um, where that horizon is, is, is up for discussion, but uh, I, I think those organizations will have to evolve uh, eventually towards that. They might do it through patches mm -hmm. if they need to, to get there, but the interesting ones, I think you cannot also innovate at scale. So imagine we're sharing the vision that we need to fly. It's not that uh, the next thing we have by Monday is uh, airports designed for the A380 with entertainment system and with all the logistics that go with it. People have died <laughs> uh, developing that vision. Mm -hmm. So we need to understand that it's a, prog it's a very challenging um, process to get there. The, my recommendation to you is perhaps Identify the clients that actually can do this. Can, uh, see the benefits, and then there will be other ones that see the benefit but might not do the, the, the work. I would love to do an ultra marathon. I yeah, I'm, I'm more thinking of because I, I really believe in what you and Panish are doing. And then, just as the space in which we live as a country forms our culture, the space in which we work would form the work culture as well, and it would help or, or hinder it, right? But I, I, the first thing I wrote in your PhD, and then I didn't read too many pages, but it's the <laughs> first page you were talking about facility management, IT and HR. And then these three functions, this is 2009, if I'm not mistaken, these three functions never interacting. That's still an issue. That is still a big issue. IT never knows, like really to the to the basic line, how many computers to buy for the new employees. They never, they can never keep track, right? It's it's even a simple as simple as an Excel file, how many new people come in so they can have their laptop and everything that they need IT-wise when they join the company. Usually what's happening, employees come, join, they have zero technology, and then maybe two weeks later they get what they were promised, right? That's really good for engagement and morale and the welcoming someone. And then facility management, I mean, they, they take care of maintenance. They, they are not even part of the discussion. Not at all. Maybe just that to get sad, someone yeah. to carry, that's sad, right? To carry a desk yeah. where it should be or modify a bit the space because this one employee is new and they don't have space for them. So they're somehow just sticking a desk in a, in a corner. So it still doesn't happen. And it's 11 years after. How... Could HR, because this will reach, this? My, my main audience is on LinkedIn, right? So how could HR support this effort that you are doing as architects? And it's funny, right? Because I've never seen an architect in an HR office. <laughs> 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 never. <laughs> I've seen them yeah. in general managers' offices discussing on how to build and what's the cost and what's the project and how many the days in delay and what does work and what doesn't work, but I've never seen them talking to HR. So how can we help you guys so we can maybe spread the same message and for not only HR, but the whole organization and the business to really understand how this can help bring productivity and bring profitability because it will get to that discussion. Yes, so I think perhaps is let's meet earlier and let's meet before there are assumptions be done. Um, usually, and this is an overgeneralization, but um, architects are approached when the solution has been defined as to be a space. So someone else 
in the room has made an assumption that there's a physical response to it. And then comes the architect. And so by then, there has been so many assumptions done about what is work, mm -hmm. how it's been designed. Through our analysis of social network mapping that we do, we have seen that the performance of the environment would be so much better if we redesign or we design work first mm -hmm. and then the workplace later. The, why do you do the things the way you do it like that? So those opportunities can only arise from earlier engagement and then remove assumptions of what you do and what I do mm -hmm. and meet in, mm -hmm. in the middle. And again, um, I have had interesting conversations with HR saying, why, why do you need to meet with us? You know, like, what is it the need of that? But once they see the data, and we come from the place of data and we show them the evidence and this, and that, then they're more open, they're more welcoming. Interestingly enough, then the conversations shift very central to HR and FM tries to go back to perhaps their operational um, area. So for us to move forward, uh, I see, as you were saying, actionable <laughs> things. Let's meet earlier. Okay. Uh, let's meet in the middle. Let's rethink, let's not try to improve what we have, but revolutionize, and let's also change the metrics. Let's stop thinking that we, um, we all this, the future of work and automation, I think um, the saddest part about this is that we, uh, machines are gonna be, re gonna replace us faster, not because machines are gonna become more human, mm -hmm but because we are actually making humans like machines. We are rewarding the behaviors that are, they make the perfect machine, reliability, productivity, yep. efficiencies. And we are neglecting the human capital. So your podcast is the skills for Mars. Yes. If you ask me what are the skills that are required in the future and then for the environment that needs to be nurtured for, 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 for that environment, are those that are uniquely human, not those that are closest to the machines. Long story short, and I can expand a little bit more on why I think that is the case, but what I think that makes us uniquely human is absurdity. So imagine, and I just saw your face there, imagine having a meeting with these traditional organizations and with HR and measuring uh, 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 productivity and this and that and say, okay, God, your time to shine comes now. How do we, what's the purpose for the future? Oh, it has to be absurd. <laughs> you call security and off I go. So when we talk about the future of work, we need to put horizons, you know, and, and try to create um, different solutions as we're saying, okay, it's not that I'm going to give you, sometimes some clients might say, I want the workplace of the future, something that is, 50 years into the future, so on. If you give them that vision, will not work. So that's only, that, that's just marketing wash, or that's just uh, not in alignment. It's just a gimmick. It's just a gimmick, exactly right, just a gimmick. So you need to recognize, okay, is your is your people there, is your culture there, is your technology there, or do you just want to have a funky office? Because usually it just boils down to, they just want a funky office. So uh, it's this idea of really, sitting down and not come with, uh, with assumptions of how the problem will be solved by any of these departments, by IT or, or FEM or HR. Another conclusion of my PhD, I think you read more of it than anyone else have read, uh, um, because the story I told at the beginning of this conversation is of, of the X-ray machine. I don't know if you remember that uh, change. So I, I started this journey thinking that technology was the driver of change in workplace. The X-ray machine changes and then their space changes and everything changes. But actually, no, I, what I found in my PhD was that the driver of change is not uh, IT or it's not space, it's economy. And by economy, I mean in its wider definition. Mm -hmm. Uh, the management of the most scarce resource. So basically, whatever the organization wants the, the most or has the least. And that could be most likely money, but can also be 
uh, time, quality in the sense of uh, talent, mm -hmm. uh, and so on. So the organization will look at their economy, specific economy, and they will look at space and technology as enablers to achieve that driver. I, I think nowadays they look at it even more as enablers. They look at technology as cost reduction. <laughs> yeah. That is a, but that's a race in the bottom. There, there will always be clients but yeah. in my, or, or people that look like that. In my case, let them be because uh, yeah. natural selection will take care of that. Sometimes I hope you're right. But sometimes I don't understand exactly how they survive. So, <laughs> so how do we build this understanding of what absurdity is and how do we foster that? Because indeed that, that makes us human. We are, yeah, otherwise we're just programmable machines. Otherwise we're just routines, everyday routines that you can mimic with a, with a, with a, with a program, with AI. So how does design lead to this nurturing of, of, of just absurdity. So <laughs> that is a fantastic question and one that I've been uh, trying to work on, but it will not happen until we are there, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, so that solution will not come until the organization or the economy wants to resolve that because you cannot talk about uh, designing for absurdity while still uh, monitoring performance or productivity and KPIs and all this and that. So in my view of the world of how work will evolve, when you think about uh, the only thing we have against uh, or as unique competitive advantage against logic-based algorithms is this human quality of being absurd. Uh, you cannot model absurdity, absurdity using logic-based models. This, uh, Paradoxical. So, yes. <laughs> so in my view, there's no doubt that we might get there. When mm -hmm. I, that's maybe one a solution that I don't have to worry about because we'll be way into the future. But in the meantime, what this lesson tells us is that we need to design what makes us uniquely human. Mm -hmm. And when we think about uniquely human, it's not only about idealizing aspects like creativity. And, and things like that, because again, they're going to be tested. And if anything, technology is already occupying that space. Uh, but also, technology is already getting creative. Creative. So, part of the research that I'm working on is, I said, call it human 360. This notion that we need to design for uh, the good and the bad qualities of what being human means. So again, when we're sitting and doing a brief, perhaps we try to put the humans in a pedestal, creative, mm -hmm. passionate, uh, which we have that. But we also have um, a tendency or, for, or a need or crave for um, routine, for other attributes that perhaps are not being nurtured by uh flexible workplace uh standards you know like prevents people from nesting and we came up with this uh even the uh, derogative term of when someone occupies uh, a space for too long you're nesting and then people come up with these strategies they call it toweling uh following from the people in the resorts you know that there's these uh uh seats in the beat in the pool or in the beach and they just put a towel yeah. early in the morning and then go have breakfast and then so people are using that technique toweling in their um, desk so they arrive in the morning they put their laptop or whatever it is just to claim that spot it's they claim their, they own the, the spot yeah and then they go and all these habits so we need to recognize that we are we need to design for sense of ownership um of all these perhaps less um, honorable uh, type of qualities of humans that we are, but as we, as technology already is looking after creativity, perhaps uh, the next solution is, is through absurdity or through uh, the uniqueness of being human. No, definitely. I, I, I hear you and you are perfectly right with... Uh routines and maybe aspects that uh, that just human that you can't get uh, 
out of our brains or the way we function just because we believe it's good or bad. It's just the way we function. It's just either in our you DNA, in it's memo, either historical. Or... Yeah. So it has to be built in. It has to be taken into, uh, into account. And I, I believe just as you, because I was reading to see different opinions, right, on the, on the future of workspaces. And then, of course, you have this very creative minds that say, yeah, there's no future workspace. You can sit at home and then you see the hologram of Gus. And then it feels like Gus is here with you uh, and you don't even make the difference between the real person and the not uh, real person. Do you think that will happen? Um, I think it will happen as soon as it transfer perhaps um, the necessary cues for you to embed the scenario that you're trying to mimic. It. So, for example, when I was doing my PhD, I was in, doing a lot of research in Second Life. Mm -hmm. Second Life, I don't know if you remember this, but Second Life, IBM actually sponsored a lot of these. They, they try to mimic uh, the real world mm -hmm. in uh, a computer, right? So you have the, th the geometry and you have the avatar, which is a 3D representation of yourself. And people did virtual offices. So they replicated their physical office there and then your avatar there. And then I was interacting with you in the virtual environment uh, just as I would be uh, in the physical environment. Now, I came across a very interesting meeting um, of which I took a screenshot in which you can create your avatar as you want and then people, of course, if you can create recreate yourself, why do it as you are? Why don't you do it? in So this Minotaur, you know, like yep. uh, mythical creatures and uh, and then people start not to recreate their space as, as the boring office that they have. So they have these floating uh, cascades and this and that. So the, the environment was to the extreme. Uh, your physical features were completely made up. Uh, you, you were creatures. But what fascinated me is that they were having this meeting in this absurd, uh, completely... Fantastic Fant fantasy. Fantastic yeah. environment. And these creatures, but all were looking at each other. Whatever the eyes were of these uh, creatures, <laughs> they were looking at each other. Now, the question arises, if you're in this impossible, um, fantastic um, environment with fantastic creatures, why are you still looking at each other? Why can't you just look apart or, or whatever? So... When you try to, um, you, you need the necessary minimum cues for you to convey the, 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 the cues that that interaction needs. In this case, meeting requires eye contact, even if it's uh, virtual. So I'm not discarding that we might get there. But the problem is, um, at this point in time, we don't have those necessary um, mm -hmm. Uh, minimum cues to replicate those environments yet. I'm not saying we're never going to get there. But again, and then the key separation is not only trans transfer of information, transfer of other emotions and so on. Uh, the, the need to combat solitude, uh, pardon, sorry, um, isolation. Yeah. Uh, we need to recognize not only about transactional actions in the workplace, it's also about nurturing humans. I know it's late for you and it's almost 10 o'clock. So I have only one last question. What's the journey that you think that you and Panish, because it seems like you are the ones uh, fighting this battle, <laughs> are going to have to go through so we can implement the kind of thinking that you are promoting? Because this is still research, early stages, uh, keynotes, talks, it didn't reach too many HR offices. And it might yes. not even have left Asia <laughs> or yes. Australia. So, so yes, uh, my collaboration with Finish has been amazing. And we have other collaborations uh, with other university, universities and other researchers as well. And, and we, if we knew, we have already done it in a way. Mm -hmm. um, so that is the spoiler to kind of indicate that I don't personally, I don't know the answer. What I do know is that it's worth fighting for. But you already kind of um, pointed to the 
an avenue that is necessary is that stop talking to the silos. Um, the saturation that you get when you go to architectural uh, conferences, it's the same. Uh, I haven't been to my um, detriment, I haven't been to many HR um, conferences. So perhaps um, start cross-pollinating and seeing the how we can contain work, not mm -hmm. Uh, great workplaces, but how we can contain work in different environments and start the dialogue from there. And it's not easy, but it yeah. should be done. Gus, would you be okay? Because I really, really like these ideas and I would like to support as much as possible because, I th again, I think it's a fight worth fighting because we are going Absolutely. to get there in the end. Um, would you be okay if I put you in contact with uh, an organization called the Conference Board? I'm not sure if you've I heard of them. To. Uh, no. It's an organization which has together, gathers together, uh, usually vice presidents, HR and talent acquisition. I've been in the talent acquisition a bit. Uh, and they have usually three, four times a year meetings. They meet in different places, either Europe or Asia or, or the US. And they have speakers as well. But this would mean really speaking to the heads of HR or the heads of, heads of talent. So the message can get... I think combined you and you and Panish with research could be quite, or at least a start, to get that them will, thinking think in a in in a direction, in a certain direction. That will be actually a, an action that will start leading to to where I think we need to go. I so would be, I would be very happy to uh, to do that definitely. That would be amazing. Perfect. <laughs> and let me know if there's anything else you think we can do from an HR perspective. Then. Um, Let's uh, let's do it, and let's not let humans become machines and obsolete let's not just because let they, that happen. they can. Exactly. <laughs> and we seem I to likewise. be heading into this standardization and uh, KPIs. Do this, do that. How many minutes does it take? How many errors? How quickly can you fix it? It is a trend, unfortunately. It is, uh, yes. And, and I, again, I really admire our human capability of making machines be like humans. But what really saddens me is that we can also have a, the dark side of making humans like machines. Yeah. So let's empower one and let's work for the other one not to, to happen. Exactly. And likewise, I extend the invitation to you. If, if, if you can think how architects um, and designers uh, help um, get to that vision sooner let's continue the dialogue perfect thank you very much gus thank you for an inspiring discussion and we keep in touch thank and you have thank a good you evening. very much thank you will <laughs> thanks you thanks good keep night. in touch talk soon take care right, bye bye, -bye.